Welcome everybody back to the next episode of the Sports Rehab Success Show, where we share you tips, tricks, and uh, things that we've done in the past to help you become one of the go-to experts in your area for sports rehabilitation or sports performance. In today's episode, what we're going to be talking about is a case study of a recent athlete that I had in my clinic to treat. Uh, this athlete was dealing with some type of neurological uh, tension symptoms through the sciatic nerve, so some pain kind of running down the leg, uh, getting down into the back of the calf, uh, a lot of tension felt in the back of the hamstring. This particular case uh, was from a disc-related pathology um, that uh, unfortunately had to be cleared up through some surgery, uh, but after surgery, uh, a very long lingering recovery process for him to get rid of this extra hamstring tension, neurological tension through the sciatic nerve. Um, obviously things such as a toe touch, straight leg raise were still bothering him even a year after surgery. Uh, this athlete was an athlete who did a lot of kicking for their sport. Um, that's about the extent that we'll get into with this case as far as uh, what they did for sport, but just know that they had to um, be involved with a lot of kicking, uh, that leg was actually their plant leg. So that probably had a little bit to do with, um, you know, the, the issue. There's a forceful kicking action that they had to accomplish, um, but it, that was their stance leg. So the amount of stretch that the hamstring was going through was fairly minimal, but we all know if we've dealt with some type of uh, uh, neurological or sciatic nerve tension, uh, symptoms before that there can be a crossover effect. So uh, when he raised the opposite leg up, uh, there was pain elicited in the uh, ipsilateral side. So his left side was affected uh, in this particular case. So a couple things, when we looked at the assessment, again, uh, you could pretty much guess that the toe touch was limited. You could pretty much guess that the straight leg raise was limited. Um, what we had found uh, was that if he spread his feet a little bit wider than shoulder width apart uh, and he was to reach down towards his right leg, um, he would get a little bit of a catching sensation kind of in the, the, the low back, the, the hamstring area as it ran down. Um, what he described that as was a kind of like if you were to floss a, a string through a needle, the pin needle head. Uh, and it just kind of being caught there and it not wanting to slide and glide back and forth, um, which a lot of people will kind of uh, relate some type of catching caught uh, blockage when they, they move with those particular um, uh, set of symptoms. Now, when he went to his left sa side or the side that was affected, that was more of the intense stretch pull nervous system tension uh, that you would expect with it. So uh, some differences that were noted side to side with the toe touch um, again, his left straight leg raise was limited significantly due to that tension. His right had more range of motion, but not what he typically would consider normal, uh, just due to having a decent amount of flexibility from being a kicker. Obviously, that straight leg raise, you would expect them to have a decent amount of mobility uh, in that range for their sport. Now, uh, that right leg lifting up, again, that caused a um, crossover effect where he had symptoms on the left side when he did that. Now. The things that we started to do for some intervention standpoint, um, one, uh, we, we started off very, very basic with some stuff. We did uh, some glute bridge isomarching where he's starting to get a hamstring contraction uh, in, the, in that leg, both right and left, uh, and then marching, going through some hip flexion, keeping that knee bent, because oftentimes they can do a lot of things with the knee bent. Um, they just can't do it with their knee straight. So driving some, uh, isometric contraction uh, to start to help desensitize the area through uh, different types of contractions that we can elicit during training. So isometric contractions through marching, keeping the knees bent, which uh, would avoid some symptom provocation at that point in time. Um, some other things that we did was just trying to get him a little bit more comfortable with flexing at the spine and going forward because it did not cause any type of lingering symptoms. Um, again, this was uh, a, a more of a chronic case. It was not an acute case after a disc injury. This was post-surgery and this was a, even a year after surgery where we we're still not getting results when he ended up seeing me. So um, 
that it wasn't very acute as far as the type of pain when flexing forward is just more of that restriction blockage a lot of tension in the hamstrings that he noted so uh, what we could do actually is get him in half kneeling and he could flex forward a lot more comfortably in that position uh, and then get used to kind of bending forward staying down in that that uh, position and then um, I'd have him kind of breathe and relax into that position and then once comfortable there what we would do is kind of push that uh, back leg or the trail leg up so now he's in kind of that typical spider-man stretch where uh, you're a lot of people do that as dyna dynamic warm-ups for their athletes where one foot's forward at about the uh, height of the hands um, and then the other legs back extended and their hips are off the ground so you got uh, one knee flexed up towards the chest you got spinal flexion because the hands are down at the ground and you got the back leg extended and kind of holding that position and going through uh, some breath cycles there too. And then we can get them to kind of rotate as well. Um, so a different way about going uh, through spinal flexion and through some spinal mobility that kind of changed the context that made it a little bit more comfortable for them, something that he could do a little bit more frequently, a little bit more often. Um, because if we're trying to change these type of symptoms, we need frequent stimulus to start convincing the body that it's okay to start moving through this range of motion again and that it's comfortable to start uh, going through that type of extreme range of motion, start taking the breaks off of it. Um, so frequency mattered more than duration, uh, so we needed to make these uh, activities comfortable. Uh, the third exercise, uh, and this one has been kind of a constant in his program that stated that way, uh, because he's felt a significant amount of relief from performing this activity um, was some leg lowering activity. So this was an ab based activity that got him to perform a straight leg raise. This was probably the most difficult for him early on and did not feel very, very comfortable for him early on. A lot of that stretch tension that was uncomfortable, maybe a slight symptom pr provocation where it uh, increased his baseline levels of pain very slightly. But again, when he stopped, Nothing lingered on, uh, it did not stay worse, so it was okay to kind of poke the bear, walk up to the edge of things a little bit, and then back off of it. Um, so we started not doing a ton of reps of these, but gradually, again, through doing it more frequently, he started to get some volume, and then he could do a lot more reps at once. And then his, his range of motion in the straight leg raise improved significantly as well too. So if you're not familiar with the leg lowering activity, what it is essentially is if you're laying on your back and you bring uh, both legs, up towards the sky and you try to keep your knees extended. Um, now again, I didn't force him through anything, but I wanted him to try to keep his legs extended. Uh, and then once both legs are up, as far as you feel comfortable, you lower one leg down and try to tap the ground or hover slightly above the ground. But again, keeping the knee straight and the foot pulled back towards you. So you keep some tension on the system there. Uh, and then you alternate back and forth between legs. So it's almost like a uh, flutter kick, but it's a lot slower, more controlled, and you're going through uh, more range of motion where you're trying to get that leg up to about 90 degrees um, where he was capable on his right side, uh, but not necessarily on the left side. Um, so that was uh, probably the most aggressive activity that we started with first. Um, and uh, we had to be careful monitoring that, but that's also, as he did more and more of them, uh, he felt looser and looser as it went on. Um, we didn't have to, we didn't want to necessarily do a ton of reps at first um, because that uh, potentially could have irritated him. Again, the frequency mattered more than the duration and the volume was uh, accruing through uh, low repetitions, but done frequently. Um, and then over time, that, that really had a correlation with improving his straight leg raise and improving his comfortability with a toe touch. So that was included um, throughout his entire program. Uh, but that was day one right there. And then after that, it was a matter of getting back into uh, some type of uh, on your feet, closed chain. So we went through a lot of RDLs um, to try to, again, get used to that hip hinge posterior weight shift and get used to that eccentric stretch of the hamstrings, but also uh, the sciatic nerve as it goes through too is going to have to get used to having, having tension with it. So started just body weight. Um, and eventually got onto normal depth where we would uh, want an RDL. And then we put a, a PVC pipe in his hand, eventually went to a barbell and eventually went to some loaded weight with that too. Um, also did like a, um, a kind of like a B stance RDL where we had the feet staggered and, and did the same thing this time with the dumbbell, just kind of uh, going down towards the ground and trying to tap the ground and come back up. So it was almost like a B stance deadlift or a uh, just a uh, feet alternated 
deadlift position there. Um, and then once he was comfortable with that, then we went to some lower level, low lightweight um, uh, deadlifts from the floor. Uh, actually, we started with from blocks, but then went to the floor. Um, again, very lightweight, make sure it was comfortable, just feel hamstring tension, nothing in the low back with it. Uh, and uh, to, to top all that off, some other things that we did was some single leg training, uh, a lot of single leg RDLs uh, to top off some of the, the bilateral movements, doing some single leg movements where getting that same uh, eccentric stretch through the hamstrings um, and the nervous system, but also working some balance component with that too. Uh, balance, single leg activity, obviously very important for uh, any type of kicking sport athlete. And uh, that, that really is what his program consisted of. Now, uh, when we talk about return to sport, return to play, uh, the thing we had to consider there was, um, you know, kicking is a very high velocity, high demand activity. So uh, anytime you kick something, there's going to be in the impact of the ball, um, but then also the velocity of the leg that goes through the movement too. So uh, what is... Um, what started to occur is we wanted to kind of gradually get him back into kicking. So eventually what we did was kind of like a pitch count or a gradual exposure back into uh, the kicking environments. Something similar to what uh, a pitcher would do when they're getting back into a throwing program. Uh, the same kind of concept was then applied to uh, the kicking situation as well too. So uh, that, that in a general sense is what we went through the program. I uh, hope you find that helpful if you're dealing with a certain case similar to that. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Uh, be sure to like, share this video if you found it helpful, and subscribe to the channel if you like more things coming your way that are similar. Again, trying to help you out the best we can. If you have any questions, uh, we'd like to hear them so that we can provide you with that information uh, so you can, again, become the go-to rehab or performance expert in your area. Everyone have a good day. Take care. We'll talk with you next time. Again, this is Greg with SportsRehabExpert.com. Hey, thanks for watching. If you found yourself wondering how we can help you more, visit us at SportsRehabExpert.com where we have more free content, products, and courses that you can take to accelerate your learning. Or you can just send me an email at Greg at SportsRehabExpert.com. And one more thing. If you found this video helpful, please subscribe so you get notified whenever a new video comes out. And please like and share any content that you feel was helpful. Thanks.